Let us then return to Acts chapter 22. The whole chapter will be our text this evening. And the title I'd like to give to the meditation is Paul's Defense. Paul's Defense. We have been going through this book, The Acts of the Apostles, which outlines to us the the history of the early Christian church. How do we get to where we are today? Well, the Apostle Paul was very keen to finish his third missionary journey, and he wanted to go back to Jerusalem, principally because he felt led by the Spirit of God to go back, because that's where he felt he had to go. But he also had another reason he had been collecting for the Jews who were suffering in Judea because of drought. And he had arranged a collection from the various Gentile churches. And now he was in a position to bring that relief to the Christians in Jerusalem. So he went to Jerusalem. He met with the leaders of the Jerusalem church. They welcomed him. But they informed him that there's a rumor going around amongst the Jews. And the rumor was that the Apostle Paul was teaching Jews who had come to believe upon the Lord Jesus that they no longer needed to obey the law of Moses. Now that was not true. The Apostle Paul never said that to any Jew who began to believe upon the Lord Jesus. He did say to the Gentiles who believed upon the Lord Jesus that they did not need to become Jews and that they did not need to obey the law of Moses in order to be saved. But people got it mixed up and a false rumor was spread around that Paul was teaching the Jews to abandon the law of Moses. And to counteract this, The leaders of the church in Jerusalem said, We have people here, we have some men here who have taken a vow. Why don't you join with them and go through the various processes in order to satisfy the rights of the vow? And when the Jews see you doing this, they will know that it's not true because you yourself are one who does uphold the law of Moses. Well, the apostle was keen to do this because he didn't want anything to detract from his usefulness in proclaiming the gospel in Jerusalem. So he took up this vow with others. He went to the temple, went through what was required of him. And at that time, there were Jews from Ephesus who saw Paul in the temple with one called Trophimus, from Ephesus and they put two and two together they said well here's Paul in the temple and he must have taken this Greek this gentle into the temple also which is against the law of Moses of course he didn't do that but that's the conclusion that they drew to And once they came to that conclusion, a riot broke out. And that's what we looked at the last time we looked at this, two weeks ago, in chapter 21. And the Romans heard about the riot, and uh, the chief captain came with at least 200 soldiers, because there were two centurions who came with them, and they managed to rescue the Apostle Paul. And here... The Apostle Paul has been given an opportunity to speak to the crowd. He's on some kind of steps, so he's risen above the crowd. He's safe for a moment because the soldiers are there protecting him. And he has been given the opportunity to defend himself. And that's why I've called the the sermon Paul's Defense. Basically, what was the charges that were laid against the Apostle Paul? Well, there was a charge that I outlined to you in a moment, a moment ago. But basically, the charges that were laid against the Apostle was that 
he was teaching people not to observe the law of Moses. In fact, he was speaking against the law and against the temple. And that he had brought a Gentile into the temple area that was reserved only for Jews. And now in chapter 22, he begins, therefore, to defend himself. There's peace and there's quietness. And we're told here in verse 2, or verse 1, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I now which I make now unto you. Now the first thing I want us to notice in our introduction is the gracious way that he spoke to them. A few moments ago they would have killed him. They would have torn him apart. Had, had they been left to their own ways, the mob rule, they would have tore him apart. And had the chief captain and his centurions not come in and save him, he would have been dead. But he says here, men, brethren, and fathers. As if to say, I have nothing against you. Nothing whatsoever. What has happened, has happened. I'm willing to defend myself. And verse 2 tells us, And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith. When it says that he spake to them in the Hebrew tongue, we are not to imagine that he spoke in the Hebrew language. Hebrew was not spoken during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ in the early first century in Palestine. It was Aramaic. That's what was spoken. And therefore, he did speak in the language or the tongue that the Hebrews used. And because of this, he obviously got a more readier audience. They were prepared to listen to him because he was able to speak to them in the language that they themselves used every day. But just to keep in the back of your mind, because it will make it a bit clearer as we get through the chapter, because he spoke to them in Aramaic, the chief captain was not able to understand what he said. And that's why at the end of the chapter, he was going to thrash it out of him. And we might speak about that later on, but he was going to scourge him in order that he might find out what exactly is going on? What exactly is the problem? Because Paul was speaking in a language that he himself did not understand. Well, there are three basic things that I wish to highlight from mainly from the first part of this chapter here, down basically to verse 21. Three things that I wish to highlight from Paul's uh, defense. And the first thing we would notice from verses 3 to 5, what do we got here? We have his early conduct. His early conduct. And let us bear in mind that as we go through this defense, Paul is seeking to address these charges that have been laid against him. That he's against the law, that he's against the temple, that he is turning his back, if you like, on his Jewishness. Well, he refutes that. And in fact, he basically is saying that the life that he now adopts is the very pinnacle of Judaism. And that's what happens. If they were truly following Judaism, it would lead them to Christianity. And this is what he wants to establish with them. And first of all, therefore, he's talking here about his early conduct. Verses 3 to 5. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. You can see, therefore, what he's trying to establish. He's a Jew. He hasn't turned his back upon his Jewishness. He's, re he's telling them that he was born in a city called Tarsus, which was a very notable city in its day. It had a wonderful university. But 
in early years, he came to this city, he came to Jer Jerusalem, and he was taught Judaism at the feet of Gamaliel, whom all recognized to be a man of God, a man of authority, a man of integrity. And that was Paul's principal teacher in Judaism. And he was, he was perfect in all the manner of the law of his fathers and was zealous toward God. And notice what he says here, as ye all are this day. He was just like them. These people who wanted to tear him apart, he could go back to his background, back to his early conduct, and he was exactly the same as them. There was no difference. He was able to speak to them man to man. He could face them in the eye, and he could see the way that you are behaving today was exactly the way that I was. There was no difference. And he goes on, and I persecuted this way, that's the Christian way, and to death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. What were they doing? They were persecuting the apostle. What did the apostle do before he was an apostle? While he was a Pharisee, what did he do? He persecuted the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would haul men and women, take them to Jerusalem in order that they might be punished. Why? Because they believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, because they recognized that he was their Messiah. Just exactly what they were doing. And he goes on to verify what he says. The high priest knows all about this. Because of my zeal to persecute the way, he went to the high priest in order that he might get validation, in order that he might get authority, whereby he may go to foreign countries like Damascus and haul the believers from Damascus and bring them back to Jerusalem in order that they might get their just reward, as he would say. And you, you can only need to ask the high priest, and he'll be able to verify this. Such was my zeal, such was my enthusiasm, and such was my hatred for the cause of Christ. He was able to identify with these people. It would have had a profound effect upon them because he was looking at the way he was. Is there an application for ourselves here today? Well, I believe there is. I believe there is an application for us. We may well be Christians. In fact, I do believe the vast majority of us are ones who profess to be Christians. That we have come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we shall look at our next heading, something glorious and wonderful has happened to us because we have believed upon the Lord Jesus. We are new creatures, but we do remember our past. We do remember what it was like in the days of unbelief. We do remember what it was like to live in unbelief. We can surely identify with those who today, without us judging anyone, but by their own confession, they are unbelievers. That they ha do not believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore we are able, in some sense, to get alongside them and to understand them and to be able to relate to them because we can say, I was just like you. There may be some people here this night who have been brought to the house of God. In some sense, they have been dragged to the house of God. Maybe more in the morning who were dragged to the house of God. They didn't want to be in the house of God. They were brought along by a, a parent or a guardian or whatever, or even tradition has brought them along. 
It's not because they want to be here, but they're being brought alone because it's expected of them. Well, friends, we can identify with that. Many of us were brought up in Christian homes and Christian families where our parents insisted that we go to the house of God when we would rather be anywhere else but in the house of God. And we never forget these things. And therefore we can side along with those who are somewhat hostile to come into the house of God and to be under the means of grace. He's able to relate to them. He's able, in some sense, not to approve of them, but he's able to sympathize with them because he's been there, he's walked there, he knows their footsteps, he knows their thinking. He was just like them. Oh, Christian, you must never, ever forget what you were like. You must know these things. You must realize these things. You cannot erase the past. We don't live in a day and generation where... We can erase our past. Our past is our past. You know, a nation might seek to readjust its history or forget its history or disown its history or erase its history, but you cannot. It cannot be done. In some sense, your history shapes and forms you, as it did here, the Apostle Paul. He relates his early conduct and he is telling them, as they are trying to tell him, that he's, he's a Jew. He was a Jew, and he's always a Jew. And he's living like a Jew. He's living like a true Jew should be. They are not, but he is. And he is impressing upon them his Jewishness. He wants them to know this. That as far as their background and as far as their credentials are concerned... He ticks all the boxes. He is truly a full-blooded Jew. Secondly, we've noticed from verses, the main part of what we're looking at from verses 6 to 16, his wonderful conversion. His wonderful conversion. We looked at his conversion before in Acts chapter 9 and what we have in Acts chapter 9 is Luke's inspired account of his conversion but what we have here and what we will have later on in another chapter is the Apostle Paul's account of his conversion and in all three accounts they all agree, but there are certain differences, as you might expect. But what we have here in these verses that I've quoted, we have his wonderful conversion. This man who was a, an arch persecutor, a hater, not just of Christ's people, and of course that is true, but as his conversion will tell us, when he was persecuting the people of Christ, he was in actual fact fighting and persecuting or seeking to persecute the Lord Jesus Christ. He was standing up against the great king and the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, for instance, And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? You think you're off to Damascus to round up a few poor Christians, and you think you're doing something good, but you need to realize what you're doing is you are persecuting Jesus Christ the Lord, the righteous one, the great Messiah, the one that has been promised for centuries and centuries to come, the just one who has come. And who do you think you are? That you are the one who is seeking to persecute the Lord Jesus Christ. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Well, what changed him? He had an encounter with Christ. We have said it before and we need to say it again. His 
experience was his experience. It was absolutely unique. There is, or there was no other Christian like the Apostle Paul. He was not only chosen to be a Christian, he was also chosen to be the principal apostle to the Gentiles. And he was the one who wrote most of the New Testament. And it's only right that we should realize that his experience was absolutely unique. And we are not to look for this kind of experience. This man was a remarkable man. He, he had a re remarkable commission that was given to him. And because of this, he needed these experiences in order that he would be able to carry out that commission that was given to him. But, basically, what happened to him must happen to every one of us. His eyes were opened. He saw the just one. At, at noon, at the time when he was on the road to Damascus, which would have been the brightest time of the day, and unlike our climate here in Scotland, the sun would have been shining. It would have been at its zenith. But he saw a bright light. Even when the sun was shining. And others saw it also. But he saw it so that he became physically blind. After his encounter he couldn't see anything. Because of the brightness of that experience that he encountered. And he heard a voice. And we've already quoted what was said to him. The others didn't hear this. This was unique to the Apostle Paul. They knew something was going on. But they did not enter into Paul's experience. It was absolutely unique. It was for him and for him only. This was a time when he was born again by the Spirit of God. And he was converted. He was transformed, changed, a new man. Oh, he was still a Jew. He didn't turn away and become a Gentile. He didn't turn his back upon what, would, what it was to be a Jew. No, he embraced the Lord Jesus Christ. A glorious, wonderful experience. And as a result, he had to be led back into Damascus. Verse 11, When I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And he met up with Ananias. And here, remember, he's telling these Jews... What's he telling them about Ananias? A devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. Again, he is stressing the Jewishness of his experience. And the Jews would recognize that there were times in the Old Testament when God did appear. And people indeed were transformed by visions and their experiences. We could think of Isaiah. What happened to him, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6? He saw the glory of the Lord. What did he see? He saw the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, the Lord. That's what he saw. And that changed him and shaped his ministry. And what he was trying to tell them was, this is perfectly in, in conformity with Judaism. And God was doing something wonderful and different here. Because he had seen the Messiah. And Ananias, who was a doubt, devout man, according to the law, therefore he was one who was respected by the Jews. And this was the one who told him what had happened to him. 
Brother Saul, receive thy sight. The God of our fathers has chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. Paul, indeed, was one who had been chosen. Again, we wonder, this is, this is glorious, this is wonderful, friends, this is unique. Here was the Lord Jesus Christ taking this arch persecutor, a Pharisee, and transforming him and making him to be a preacher, not just of the Jews, but of the Gentiles. And through him, he was going to build his church. And we may well wonder, well, this is beyond us. We're not living in that age Oh, but friends, there is a lesson here for us. There's a lesson that we must learn. We must have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ as he became blind when he saw the light. Friends, we must see when we see the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. We were thinking some time ago about blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus, what was he? He was one who was blind. He couldn't see a thing. And you know the story well, I'm not going to go over it. But he was physically blind and he heard about the Lord Jesus. He heard that he was passing by and he cried out. He asked, Who's, what's this? What's this commotion? What's happening? What did they say to him? Jesus of Nazareth passes by. What was he going to do? He recognized this was his golden opportunity. The Messiah is passing by. But it's not Jesus of Nazareth to him. No, it's Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Oh, be quiet, the crowd said. He's not going to listen to you. You're blind. You're a beggar. He's no time for you. What did Bar blind Bartimaeus do? He cried out the more, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. You know, friends, he was blind physically, but he could see spiritually. He could see what the crowd never saw. He recognized that this man is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. And he can open my eyes because this is something that the Messiah was destined to do. He was to open the eyes of the blind. And you know, his eyes were opened. And all around them, people could see. They had 20-20 vision, but they didn't see that Jesus was the Messiah. And this is the way for us. We must be converted, friends. We must see him. We must recognize that he is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. We must recognize that he is the one who has come down from heaven. And we must recognize that he comes with the full authority of his Father in heaven. He is the only one who can save. Friends, have we got this? Do we know this? Have we been converted? How do we know if we're being converted? If you believe upon the Lord Jesus, you have been converted. Because you cannot believe upon him until you are born again. Oh, you might hear about him and you might believe in him in a historical sense. You might recognize that he is truly an historical figure like Julius Caesar, like Hitler. Historical figures that you've never met. But you know about them. But to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ in a saving manner is to put your faith and hope and trust upon him. It is to recognize him for who he is and what he has done. This is what happened to the Apostle Paul. He had been persecuting him. Now his eyes were opened. Although they were blind for a moment, his physical eyes were blind for a moment, yet his spiritual eyes were wide open. He could see things clearly that he never saw before. Where are we then? Do we know anything of this conversion? Do we know anything of turning our backs upon our old lives? Oh, he was still a Jew and he, was, he would always be a Jew. 
but he turned his back upon his unbelief. Well, thirdly and briefly, we might notice his special calling. His special calling. From verses 17 to 21, now he's talking here in verse 17 about another time when he was in Jerusalem. Not the time he's, he was now looking at, but another occasion, an earlier occasion. And again, he's trying to draw to their attention that he's still a Jew and he still has reverence for the temple. And all that goes on there, he has not turned his back upon that. And he says here in verse 17, about an earlier time he was in Jerusalem. And it came to pass that when I was again in Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him, that's Jesus, the one that he met on the Damascus road, saying unto me, Make haste. And get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. He is reminding them, or informing them, that he has a special commission. And he received that commission in the temple. Because it goes on towards the end of verse 21. Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And that was a spark that started a great fire. When they heard the fact that the Messiah had, was going to send one of his people, an apostle, with the gospel to the Gentiles, they wouldn't listen to him anymore. Because it was an, an anathema to them to think that the Gentiles would have anything do, to do with the Jewish Messiah. They thought that the Messiah was exclusively for the Jews and the kingdom of God was for them. And they didn't realize that the kingdom of God was for all nations, all kingdoms, all tongues. And that God was moving through the Jews in order to evangelize the whole of the world. Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And then the rioting began again. And because of the fact that the chief captain didn't understand what was said, he thought he would thrash it out of the Apostle Paul. And here Paul uses his Roman citizenship to save him. He was bound and he was about to be scourged. Now this was not just a whipping. That would be bad enough. The Apostle Paul had that on another occasion. But this was something else. He was bound with thongs. And they were about to whip him with leather. And on that leather, there would have been sharp pieces of bone and of metal. And they would have tore his skin. And had he been scourged by the soldiers, he would never have been the same again. Many people scourged by the soldiers would be killed. It was that terrible. And he would certainly be handicapped. And that's when he used his right as a Roman citizen. My time's up, but basically, a Roman citizen, you could buy your citizenship. That's what happened here, the chief captain, he bought it. But it's basically, he would bribe someone to give it to him. He would bribe an officer or whatever, whatever he got this, you couldn't actually buy it, you had to bribe someone to get it. If you were a high-ranking official in the Roman Empire, you might be awarded a Roman citizenship. If you had been illustrious in the warfare, you may well get one that way. 
Paul says he was born free. What does that mean? Well, it means that it was passed on to him from his father. We don't know how his father got it, but that was one way. A father could pass it on to his son. And if you were a Roman citizen, you couldn't be scourged without being first condemned. You needed a fair trial. And when Paul told them that he was a Roman citizen, he was putting himself under the jurisdiction of Roman law. And that would ultimately end with him going to Caesar. But he used it in order that he might protect himself. Because had he gone through with it, he would never have been the same again. But he was reminding these individuals here that he had a special calling. He didn't take up this role by himself. He didn't think, oh, I'm going to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He didn't think, I'm going to go and preach here and there because I want to do it. He was called. He was commissioned. Now, we're not apostles. We're not prophets. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who gives pastors, ministers, elders, deacons to his church. They don't take that role on themselves. He calls them. And those he calls, he equips. And the Apostle Paul here was eminently qualified for what he undertook. His ministry vindicated it. The churches that he formed, the gospel success that he knew, obviously with the blessing of God, vindicated the fact that he was called of God. And others could see it. We noticed that when Barnabas recognized Paul way back in the early stages. Barnabas saw him and took him and introduced him to the, to the church leaders and to the church at Antioch. Why? Because he recognized this man indeed is an apostle. He's got the gifts. He's got the graces. He's got the call. He's got the authority. The God-given authority that God gives to those who have been called. It's a special calling. And not everyone gets it. We have to get that. And the apostles telling them, I'm a Jew, and I have been called by Jesus Christ to preach the gospel, not just to the Jews, but ultimately to the Gentiles. Something they could not tolerate. Paul's defense. Amen. And may God bless his word to us.